Yes. And can you see my presentation? Yes, also. Very good, so I can start. Okay, so uh, yes, I will show you an example of one of the quite powerful technique that can be used to study uh, proteins and protein complexes in vitro, which is light scattering and different flavors of light scattering. Um, so um, in the first part of my presentation, I will uh, introduce you to the theory of light scattering and uh, explain how multi-angle light scattering and dynamic light scattering works. And after the short break, uh, we'll have a short practice or examples. Uh, well, because of the online form of this meeting, uh, I cannot show you directly the equipment and how, the, how it works. So I have recorded very short uh, videos and I will show you the software on my computer. And in the end, I will show you a case study uh, that explains uh, an example uh, when uh, information from multi-angle light scattering was actually very useful to ask, answer the biological questions that we're asking. Um, so uh, let's start with this uh, short list of available methods. Uh, some, if not most of them, were already explained uh, by the previous uh, speakers. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I have divided them into the high throughput methods, and that can be done in vivo, most of, uh, at least most of them, and low throughput methods that can be uh, most of the time used in vitro. And uh, as you can see, the light scattering methods are here. So this is just a very, very tiny part of this slide. So it's definitely not the uh, most important method, but it is very useful. So when we are talking about the uh, methods that uh, can help us to characterize the protein-protein interactions, uh, we also have to ask ourselves the question, uh, what factors are important for us when we choose the, 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 our method. So uh, one of the factors that is important is the scale of the experiment. You will pick different methods when you need to find the partner in the cell, and you will pick a different method if you want to verify already a short list of the potential partners. Again, you will uh, need to think about the environment uh, in which you want to test uh, the interaction. Some methods are applied only in vivo, the other can be used only in vitro, and there are also some in silico methods, uh, bioinformatical methods. Uh, the third thing that you need to think about is the detection method. Uh, some methods are label free, so you can just use the proteins uh, out of the box, even uh, either um, uh, in a tube or in uh, some more sophisticated equipment. The other methods require some manip manipulations of the protein, so you need to attach to it some fluorescent la label or the GFP or other mo modify the protein different way. So then it, it, ex it again adds some extra layer of complexity to your setup. And there are some other important factors like sample requirements, like quantity or quality of your sample. If you are working with recombinant protein, then you can use a lot of in vitro methods that are very powerful. But if, if you work with very dirty, very difficult to purify sample, then probably most of the uh, sophisticated in vitro methods are not available for you and you need to focus on some other techniques. And of course, there are some factors like cost, time, an effort that you need to spend uh, on the particular experiment. So this is not the, uh, not the easy answer which method you want to choose. And when it comes to the light scattering methods, um, <clears throat> uh, most of them are rather low throughput, uh, multi-angle light scattering coupled to side execution chromatography. Single experiment takes about one hour. So if you want to test uh, 10 or 20 interaction partners, you can do it in one or two days. But if you want to screen the whole library of different factors, then it's probably not possible. Dynamic light scattering can be parallelized. So there are some devices to do these measurements in uh, multi-well plates. So it can be treated as a high throughput method, but again, it also can work in the low throughput mode just in a single cuvette. Um, so I would call those methods rather the verification methods, not the identification, but again, DLS can be also used for the identification of new interacting partners. Both of the methods are uh, rather used in vitro and uh, there are label free methods so you don't need to modify your proteins uh, in order to to see the results okay so uh, what uh, why and when um, in my presentation i will try to show you what can be learned from light scattering experiments but briefly for single proteins the most important parameter that we can get from the uh, these methods is either molecular weight when it comes to the static light scattering or the hydrodynamic radius when it comes to the dynamic light scattering. So from these parameters, you can calculate the oligomeric state of your protein, 
Sometimes you can also uh, get some information about the shape of your protein or protein complex. Another layer of parameters that you can get from those methods is the stability, aggregation, and melting temperature, and other biochemical, uh, biophysical parameters of your sample that may be important in some in your sample optimization steps, for example. And when it comes to the protein complexes or protein-protein interfaces, of course, when you have the molecular weight of our complex, then we can easily calculate the stoichiometry of different subunits. We can check if the purified complex is actually intact, if all subunits are there and are interacting with each other. Uh, by doing some, um, a lot of different experiments, like uh, checking the interaction, binary or trimary interaction, and so on and so forth, you can also build the interaction map between the subunits of large multi subunit complex. So this is also possible and quite uh, easy with the multi angle scattering techniques. Uh, of course, we ask such such questions because we want to answer the biological questions. So this is the ma major question we ask how the complex works. But there are also a lot of technical questions that can be answered using the multi angle light scattering or dynamic light scattering. For example, stability or aggregation of the sample are the two parameters that are very important if you want to perform the structural biology studies. So dynamic light scattering and multi-angular scattering are very often used to assess the quality of the sample prior to the crystallization or cryo-EM um, experiments. And so uh, when can we use those methods? So basically we need a pure, concentrated and relatively stable sample. So most of the time we are talking about the recombinant proteins or recombinant uh, protein complexes. If you are lucky, and you can isolate your sample from the original source in a large enough quantity, then you can also use the, the, the samples purified directly from the cells, but it will be expensive because we need the microgram amounts of the sample for each experiment. So the, the, that may be very costly. And if we don't have that pure sample, then probably results that we get will not, that, will not be that uh, uh, easy to interpret because all contaminations, especially large macromolar contaminations, uh, introduce a lot of noise to our experiments. And I will explain you why this noise is so difficult to deal with with light scattering methods. Okay, so uh, let's start with the um, size exclusion chromatography because this is the very basic method uh, for biochemical purification of proteins. And um, we can couple it to the multi angle light scattering, but to understand the principles of this, we need to first uh, discuss the size occlusion chromatography itself. So, this is the um, <coughs> FPLC, so fast protein liquid chromatography machine in the left, uh, with the size occlusion chromatography attached to it. Uh, do you see my cursor? I hope so. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so I can point to some things on the pictures. So uh, this size occlusion chromatography column is just a large column with the impact with the bead that can separate molecules according to their sizes. So if we inject into that column the mixture of proteins or other molecules of different sizes, they will migrate through the column. And the larger the column is, the quicker it will migrate. So in the middle of the column, the situation will be like this. So the large proteins or large molecules are already passed through the column. The medium size are still in the middle and the very small are very, it's very difficult for them to pass through the column. So they will leave the column in the very end. Um, at the end of the column, after the column, we mm, put some detector so we can observe the uh, actual separation of the molecules. So this is example, size occlusion chromatography profile of the, the sample. And we see that at the very beginning, the first peak contains the largest objects that were injected into the column. Then smaller objects form the second peak and the smallest objects will leave the column at the very end of the separation range. So what kind of detectors we can use for the detection of the samples? For proteins, most of the time we just use the UV detector that works at 280 nanometers because this is the, uh, the, the detection range for the proteins that are very, is very handy for us. But uh, uh, some HPLC machines can also be equipped with the refractometer, so RI detector that detects the changes in the refractive index of the solution that leaves the column. It can detect both proteins and samples that doesn't 
uh, absorb the UV light. So it is very powerful, but less popular in the biological labs. The third type of detectors is the light scattering detectors. And I will talk about those detectors later on. And we can also imagine about any other detect detection technique. We can, for example, check the fluorescence of the fractions from the size of chromatography to de detect the fluorescently level protein. We can also collect the fractions, run them on the gel, and detect the presence of the single particular protein with the Western, with so-called dot blot uh, technique on, on things like that. So the detect there are many different ways of the of the detection, but the most important are the UV detectors. Okay, and um, what are the sample requirements for this kind of experiment? So typically, uh, to obtain high resolution separation of the proteins, you need to inject something like 1% of the column volume. So typical analytical column or uh, size chromatography column has 24 milliliters, which means that you will inject something like 100 microliters up to 500 microliters of your sample into the column. So uh, it's not very preparative. There are, of course, larger columns. For example, into this column, you can inject up to five milliliters of your sample. But if you want to purify something from uh, hundreds of milliliters, this is not the method of choice, obviously. Um, and what can be in injected into this kind of column? Well, people work either with the crude protein extracts from the cells. So then, then the profile shows you the separation of all the proteins that were present in the protein extract. And then definitely you need to detect your protein of interest with uh, Western blot or other specific detection technique. Or you can insert into, in, inject into the column already purified proteins, like recombinant proteins. Then the peaks on the chromatogram will most likely contain the purified proteins and no uh, other contamination. So this is like method for polishing of your sample as the final purification step. Um, yeah, so, uh, but apart from the um, uh, qualitative result, you can also quantify the results of the size exclusion chromatography. So it, it, it appears that the migration in the column uh, correlates with the size of the molecules. So we can plot this kind of uh, graph. If we take a logarithm of the molecular weight of the sample injected into the column, and on this axis, we plot the elution volume, we see that the logarithm of molecular weight of the sample correlates negatively with the elution volume. So the large proteins leaves the column quite early, and the small proteins leave the column uh, at the later stages. So, and this is fairly linear, as you can see. So if we calibrate our column with some standard proteins and inject an unknown sample, then we can calculate, approximate molecular weight of the sample based on this elution volume. And this is the very traditional way of using size exclusion chromatography for calculation of the molecular weight. And it's not perfect because actually uh, what we should have on this axis is not the molecular weight, but the size of the protein. So this works only for very, very globular proteins. So to sum up the size of chromatography, uh, we have shown that the elution volume is negatively correlated with the logarithm of molecular weight. But there are some very important assumptions. Uh, uh, and one of them is that the sample has the same conformation as the standard that we use for calibration. So if we always work with globular proteins, it will work. But if our protein complex is, for example, very elongated, uh, then it will migrate not the standard way in the column. The other example is the disordered proteins. They are definitely not globular, and they migrate very differently on size exclusion chromatography columns. So in that case, you may have very wrong results. Uh, if you try to calculate the expected molecular weight of the, the sample that coming from the column. The other assumption is that the density of the sample. So if, the, if you work with proteins, everything is fine. But if you inject the polymer on the column or some other object like nucleic acid, then the migration will be slightly different because of the different density of that molecule. And the third very important assumption is that the molecule does not interact with the column. It, sometimes the, there is a problem with that your protein sticks to the column and then its migration is aberrant and you cannot calculate the molecular weight based on that uh, migration profile, obviously. Uh, and now to add one more point to this list, um, your protein needs to be stable enough to survive the size exclusion chromatography. Uh, most of the proteins are 
are stable, but protein complexes may not be stable enough. And there are plenty of examples of large macromolar complexes that are disrupted upon injection into size extrusion chromatography. Thus, the glycerol gradient technique that was mentioned by Marcin Novotny was invented to purify such large macromolar complexes. Uh, so if one of those assumptions is not made, then we cannot calculate properly the molecular weight of the sample that was injected on the colon, and we need to use some different sources of information, and one of them is the light scattering. So um, uh, the principles of light scattering uh, were invented by Lord Ray Light, actually John William Strutt uh, in the 19th century, and he asked himself a question, why the sky is blue? And I hope after the next five minutes, you will be able to answer this question fairly easily. Uh, but to, for that, we need to understand how particles scatters the light. So let's start with the single particle. This is a very small object, uh, very small, uh, let's say the atom, for example. And let's illuminate this, uh, this object, this particle with the light. What happens inside that particle when it is illuminated with the light? Well, the, the, the light is actually the wave um, and energy of this wave is, proper, is proportional to the amplitude square of the electric field. And since the electric field fluctuates inside that object, this induces dipolarization of the charges of our object. For example, if this is an atom, then electrons will go to the one side of the uh, object, the protons will be slightly more clustered on the other side. Uh, so, and the light, the wave fluctuates, so this di dipole also fluctuates with the same frequency of the incident light. So, in practice, this particle becomes a small dipole scatterer, and as a dipole scatterer, it will scatter the light. So it will emit the light, the same like the radar antenna emits the light, the, 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 the radio waves. So, Again, if we do some, um, uh, uh, the intensity of the scattered light is proportional to so-called polariz poly polarizability of the molecule. So this polarizability can be expressed as the specific refracting index increment, which is called DNDC. And we can see from the equation that the intensity of the scattered light is proportional to the square of this DNDC. So some particles will scatter more light while the other will scatter less light, depending on this particular parameter. Another factor is the wavelength of our incident light. So if we calculate the um, total energy of the scattered light, it will it become apparent that the instant intensity of the scattered light needs to be inversely proportional to the fourth power of the wavelength of the incident light. Otherwise, the, the energy would, would, won't be the same. So this is actually the answer to our question why the sky is blue. If we look at the wavelength spectrum of the sunlight, um, and we know that the intensity of the scattered light is much stronger for the shorter wavelengths, it means that if the, sky is uh, if the sun is shining on the atmosphere, then the sunlight is scattered on the atmosphere, mostly on the oxygen and nitrogen atoms. And, uh, shorter wavelengths are scattered much stronger than the longer wavelengths. That's why when you look at the sky, maybe not today, the sky is blue because this blue color is much better scattered than the red or yellow colors. So that, that was the conclusion of the ray light in 19th, uh, 19th century, but this is not the end of our journey with the light scattering theory. There is another factor that we need to think about, which is the what happens when we have several particles. So let's imagine those two point scatterers, and again, the incident light that hits both those two molecules. Both of them will scatter the light independently. <clears throat> and the intensity of the scattered light will be proportional to the sum of the squared energy of the first scatterer and the second scatterer. So the, the light emitted by those two objects is incoherent because they are moving with the Brownian motion. So there is no phase correlation between those two scattered light waves. So because of that, the intensity of the scattered light is just the basic sum of the intensity uh, coming from the first object and from the second object. Now, 
what happens if we join the two objects with let's say molecular bond now the two scatterers are always within the same distance which means that the intense the two waves that are coming from those two objects are coherent they are in the same phase so in that condition the total intensity of the scattered light is not the basic sum of the energy of the first one and the second one but there is also some cross term that uh, is caused by the uh, uh, correlation of those two waveforms which means that the total intensity is larger than the sum of the intensity of the first one and the set second one so <clears throat> it's actually very easy to calculate how large it is if those two particles are exactly the same in the first case, the intensity is proportional to the two squared energies of the one of the objects. In the other case, it's just the solving the square equation, it will be two times larger. So the intensity will be proportional to the four squared energies, which means that just by joining our two objects together, we have doubled the intensity of scattered light. So if we think about it a little bit more, then we'll see that from the first example we see that the intensity of the scattered light is proportional to the concentration of our particles if we double the number of particles then the the, the intensity will be doubled from the second example we see that the intensity is also proportional to the mass of our scatterers if the scatterer is two times larger, then the intensity will be also two times larger. So we can uh, rewrite our equation as the intensity of the scattered light is proportional to the mass times concentration times the polarizability. Now, if you think a little bit more about it, we see that the concentration when it comes uh, when I'm, I'm not talking about the molar concentration but just the total mass of the particles that are scattering the the light is proportional to the third power of the diameter of our particles and the molecular weight is also proportional to the volume which is the third power of the diameter of the particles so in summary the intensity of the scattered light is proportional to the sixth power of the size of our particles, which means that the intensity of the scattered light very, very strongly <clears throat> uh, depends on the size of our particles. And that's why if you want to measure the protein sample, you need to eliminate all of the aggregates because aggregates are large, which means that they will scatter a lot of light and the signal from the aggregates will completely cover the signal from your proteins. And this is very important information for you if you want to use the light scattering in your experiments. So um, now uh, there is yet another assumption that we need to take. Um, let's go back to this slide. We have joined those two molecules and we have assumed that the wave that is emitted from the, this object and this object is in exactly the same phase. But this holds true only if this object is very small in comparison to the wavelength of our light. Because if the object is very large, then this part of the object will be, uh, will be in different phase than the other object. So for small scatterers, which are like uh, smaller than 10 nanometers in the, um, for the visible light, the scattered light is isotropic, which means that the intensity of the scattered light is the same in all directions. And for such small scatterers, we can do very nice calculations. For larger scatterers, the intensity of the scattered light becomes a function of the angle at which we measure the scattered light. So for larger objects, we need to take this into account so this is a little bit problematic, but since we know the theory behind that, we can also calculate much more things about those larger objects. For proteins and protein complexes, most of them are very small relative to the wavelengths because these 10 nanometers 
is the radius, not the diameter. So only very large, I don't know, ribosomes or viruses are larger than uh, 20 nanometers in diameter. So most of the proteins and protein complexes will be isotropic scatterers. So let's sum up the theory of the light scattering. We uh, have show, uh, shown that the laser induces the oscillating dipole within the molecules. And this oscillating dipole will re-radiate the light with the same frequency as the incident light. It means that the scattering is elastic. So the frequency of the emitted light is the same as the incident light. Now, uh, we show that the intensity of the radiated light is proportional uh, or depends on the polarizability of our molecule, which can be uh, explained as the DNDC. It also is proportional to the concentration of the molecules and is proportional to the molecular weight of the molecules. So knowing this, we can actually use the static light scattering to calculate the molecular weight of our sample. So this is the equation that we already had and we can rearrange it. So now we see that the molecular weight is proportional to the intensity of the scattered light divided by the concentration of our sample. In practice, the light scattering can be divided by the signal that is used to quantify the concentration, for example, by the UV detector of the machine or by the refracting index detector of the machine that we are using for our calculations. So again, we can plot a graph. These are three example proteins. This is the molecular weight of those proteins. And on that axis, we see the light scattering divided by the concentration in this example in the refracting index units. And we see that the correlation is perfectly linear. According to that equation, it should be. So everything works nicely. So with that knowledge, we can already try to do some nice calculations. This is the chromatogram of the BSA, bovine sebum albumin. And we have two signals. One is the light scattering, and the other is the refracting index, which is proportional to the concentration of our sample in the fraction from the sex zone chromatography column. And the signals are aligned the way that in this peak number two, both of the signals are at the same height. Now, if we look at the peak number one, we see that the light scattering signal is two times higher than the refracting index signal. And we know that two times stronger light scattering means that the molecular weight of the particles that are scattering is two times larger, which basically means that these must be dimers of the BSA. Okay, but it is not very quantitative. We can just compare the signal from different peaks and tell that this one is two times larger, this is probably four times larger and so on and so forth. But how to calculate the exact molecular weight? Well, for this, we need to use some slightly more sophisticated calculations and measure the scattering light at different angles. And that's the multi-angle light scattering term. So um, the equations that I showed you were uh, valid, but uh, we just show the proportionality of one values to the other values. And there is this proportionality constant that can be actually described in the very nice terms to the, uh, and uh, if we know this proportionality constant, we can really calculate the exact molecular weight without knowing the, 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 the molecular weight of the monomer, for example, here. So to, to do this, we need to uh, do two things. First, we need to extrapolate our results to the scattering angle zero. We already know that the scattering should be isotropic for small molecules but for large molecules, it won't be isotropic. So we need to know how the scattering will behave at the zero angle. And we need to also extrapolate the scattering to the zero concentration, because for high concentration samples, we may observe some uh, multiple scattering events, which may uh, change our result. 
So to do those two extrapolations, the easier way is to connect the light scattering detector or multi-angle light scattering detector, which contains different detectors at different angles, directly with size occlusion chromatography column. So this is the experiment layout. We have a solvent, the pump. This is actually the FPLC of HPLC device. Then we inject the sample into the column. And after the column, there is UV detector. Next, light scattering detector. Most of the time, there is also yet additional detector. Like here, there is the refracting ink detector. And based on the signal from light scattering detector and information about the concentration of our sample from either UV detector or refracting ink detector, we can calculate the molecular weight of the particles that are coming from the size exclusion chromatography column. So this is the example of calculations. For each slice of the chromatogram, the software plots the intensity of the scattered light at different angles, then calculates the intensity at the zero angle. And based on it, it plots the molecular weight of this particular fraction of the profile. There is, this is the scale for the molecular weight on this graph. So we see that in this peak, the particles have around 60 something kilodaltons, while in this peak, the moleculars have around 120 kilodaltons. This is again BSA. BSA has 67 kilodaltons. So this is the monomer and this is the dimer. And we can calculate those molecular weight without any a pure information about our sample. So let's sum up this. For static light scattering and uh, in particular multi-angle light scattering, we need to have a good sample. So it is very powerful technique to calculate the molecular weight of very broad distribution of the samples, starting from around one kilodalton up to megadaltons or even gigadaltons. So even for very small proteins or peptides, it will work. And it will also work for large objects like viruses or even larger objects. But we need to remember about the relation between the intensity of the scattered light and the size of our object. So for a very small object like one kilodalton, we need to use very high concentration of our protein to have enough signal. For large objects like megadalton objects, we can use very, very tiny concentration of our sample and the light scattering will be strong enough. So the concentration of our sample depends on the size of our sample. The sample needs to be as pure as possible because all aggregates will have very strong effect on the light scattering signal. And you may think that the light, the size exclusion chromatography can easily separate aggregates that will come somewhere here from our peak that is here. And this is not always the true because large aggregates will migrate throughout all the column and the signal of light scattering detector will be very strong even over those peaks. So aggregates will basically kill our results. So it is very important to get rid of the, at least most of the aggregates if you want to run the multi-angle light scattering experiment. So you need to spin down your sample or filter it. The volume of the injected sample depends on the system. So for standard columns, it's typically around 100 microliters, but I was also performing the experiment with as small volumes as five microliters. And the typical concentration is around 0.5 milligrams per milliliter which means that we would inject around 50 micrograms of our sample into the column. It's a lot. If your protein or protein complex is much larger, then you can reduce the concentration significantly. For example, for 100 kilodalton objects, you can inject just 10 micrograms or even lower amounts. But if you work with, I don't know, 10 kilodalton proteins, probably you'll have to inject at least 100 micrograms into the column to have enough signal. And last but not least, all the buffers needs to be filtered and really filtered to get rid of all the particles that may be in the buffer and will uh, affect the light scattering detector. Okay, so knowing this, we already can uh, sum up the multi-angle light scattering the method. 
So we we already know that this method is very powerful because then it can give us the absolute molecular weight calculation for our sample, which is independent of the shape. Pure size exclusion chromatography technique can also be used to assess the molecular weight, but the results of the size exclusion chromatography depends heavily on the shape of our protein, while the light scattering techniques doesn't depend on the shape. So regardless of the fact if the sample is globular, elongated or disordered, we'll have the exact calculation of the molecular weight. If everything is perfect, then the error in the molecular weight calculation is below 5%, which is quite accurate and most of the time enough to get the information about the stoichiometry of our protein complex. Of course, it may be problematic if you have very large protein complex like 500 kilodaltons and you want to add to it like five kilodalton small subunit, then it won't be accurate enough. But for standard situations, this 5% error is fairly enough to, to know what is happening in our system. And for multi angle light scattering, most of the calculations are performed in line with the size occlusion chromatography column. <clears throat> but we can also use this technique in batch to monitor sample aggregation in time. So if we inject our sample into the device, and leave it there for, I don't know, half an hour and we'll monitor the light scattering. Then if the sample aggregates, we'll see that the light scattering increases over the time. So we can use it to monitor the, for example, aggregation of our sample. And for large objects, which are significantly larger than 10 nanometers, there is this dependence on the light scattering on, on the angle. And based on that dependence, we can more or less calculate the RMS radius of our sample, which will give us the information about the shape, which means we can calculate if the sample is globular or it is elongated, which also can be quite interesting in some cases. Okay, so that's all about the multi-angle scattering theory. Now let's go to the dynamic light scattering. It will be much shorter, I hope. Uh, dynamic light scattering can be also called quells, Fuzzy elastic light scattering or PCS, photon correlation spectroscopy. These are all the names of the similar technique that is based on the light scattering. But this time we are measuring not the average intensity of the scattered light, but we check the fluctuations of the intensity of the scattering in that time. So this is the principle of the dynamic light scattering experiment. We have a cuvette. We have a laser that illuminates the part of this cuvette, and we have a lot of particles that are moving around in the cuvette. So the detector this time is typically at 90 degrees from the laser beam. So we don't observe the direct beam, but we observe only the scattered light. And the light is scattered by all molecules that are illuminated by the laser. This time the detector is not calculating the average intensity, but it is very fast uh, photon correlation detector, which detects the intensity in very short time scales. So if we wait a little bit more, because of the Brownian motions, all the particles will move a little bit. This particle come into the laser, this is leaving the laser, and the total intensity of the light scattered by those particles is slightly different because of the interference, because of the particles moving in and out and so on and so forth. So if we plot the intensity of the scattered light over the time, we'll see that it fluctuates. In static light scattering, we'll just measure the average intensity. But here in dynamic light scattering, we have very fast detectors, so we can actually see the fluctuations of the intensity caused by the Brownian motions of our particles. Now let's take a closer look at what is happening in here. Um, if we get this kind of data, we can try to calculate so-called correlation function of those data. So if we compare the intensity of the scattered light in very short time delay, then the intensity is very similar because the, the, the change of the intensity is almost negligible. So at very short time scales, there is very high correlation between the intensity of the scattered light. 
Now, if we go further from this time point, then the intensity becomes less and less correlated with the first time point because of the Brownian motion and of the stochastic behavior of this graph. So at large time points, the intensity of the T0 plus tau is totally not correlated with the initial intensity. And there is some drop at some point, which is very important for us. So this is the autocorrelation curve for this graph. Um, we can also fit the exponential decay to this graph. And this kind of second order correlation function depends on the diffusion coefficient, which is here. And the diffusion coefficient is the coefficient that explains how our particle diffuses in the solution. So basically, it explains us how quick it, the, the Brownian motion of that particle are. Now, let's take a look at the second particle that is much larger. This particle will diffuse slower. So the Brownian motion of large particles will be much slower. So the fluctuations of the intensity will be again slower. So if we calculate the autocorrelation function of this kind of data, it will have very similar shape, but the decay of the correlation signal, which will be delayed. So looking at this autocorrelation function, we already see that the blue particle or blue signal corresponds to smaller particle than the red signal, which is larger particle. So looking at the autocorrelation function that is calculated based on the fluctuations in the intensity of the scattered light, we can calculate the diffusion coefficient of the particles that are in solution. Now, using the so-called uh, Stokes-Einstein relation, we can, from the diffusion coefficient, calculate the hydrodynamic radius of our particles. This equation is very important because it relates the hydrodynamic radius, which is the size of our particle, with the diffusion coefficient of our sample. But we see that this relation depends on some factors that are very important. First of all, it depends on the temperature. So this kind of calculations needs to be performed in constant and very well controlled temperature. Because if we increase the temperature, then the Brownian motions will be much faster. And second important parameter for us is this value here, which is viscosity of the solvent. If we use the solvent, which let's say 10% of the glycerol, then the solvent will be much more viscous. And the diffusion coefficient of our particles in such viscous solvent will be, well, the, the particles will move slower because of the viscosity of the solvent. So we need to take this into account while calculating the hydrodynamic radius of the particle. So these are the parameters that we need to know before we start the experiment. Um, so what actually is the hydrodynamic radius? It's very easy. So this is the radius of the sphere with the same diffusion coefficient at our sample. So again, we are in the kind of risky area. We are not talking about the molecular weight of our sample. We are talking about the size of our sample. So exactly like with the classical size occlusion chromatography techniques from DLS, we'll get information about the size of our molecules, which may be, be translated to the molecular weight, but under the assumption that our particles are perfectly globular. If our particles are not globular, then the hydrodynamic radius is what we get, not the molecular weight. So the result of the dynamic light scattering is the hydrodynamic radius. And we need to assume that our particles are either globular or extended to, to calculate the molecular weight from it. So how it works in practice, this is the true autocorrelation curve for one of the sample. We see that the correlation is very high at very short time points, and then it drops to, to negligible correlation at larger points. And based on this kind of autocorrelation curve, the software calculates the distribution of the hydrodynamic radii in our samples. In that example, 
we have a peak around here, which is around five nanometers, exactly 4.4 4 nanometers. So most of the particles in our vial had this kind of diameter. There is also another peak with very large uh, radius that corresponds to most likely aggregates because the calculated molecular weight is very huge for it. And we can also see that intensity of this peak, it was almost 95% of the total intensity. While this peak contributed to 5% of the total intensity. But if we calculate the masses, then in this peak, actually 100% of the particles reside in this peak. So there were just a very, very tiny amount of aggregates, but because of this, the scattering of large objects is very strong, we see the aggregates in here. But the percentage of aggregates is around zero. I mean, below 0.1%. So DLS, first of all, can give us information about the hydrodynamic radii of our sample. There is also another factor that is called polydispersity, and this is the half width of this peak. So if the peak is very narrow, it means that all the particles are more or less of the same size. If the peak is broad, it means that this is the average radius, but some particles are smaller, some particles are larger. And the other information that we get from this kind of analysis is this extra peak from aggregates. So DLS can detect even very small traces of aggregation. If the amount of aggregated protein is significant, like 5%, then probably we won't be able to measure this peak. But we can detect even very small, tiny amounts of aggregates and use this technique for, for example, sample optimization if we want to screen different buffers or different additives to our sample. Okay, so let's sum up. With dynamic light scattering, we can calculate the hydrodynamic radius of our particles, uh, which give us information about the size, monodispersity, or polydispersity of our samples, which is the distribution of the hydrodynamic radii in our sample. From this, if we assume that our sample is globular, we can also roughly approximate the molecular weight, but this is not the major outcome of the DLS. This is like extra stuff. And for polydispersed samples, <clears throat> which are not the single kind of particles, we can also get some information about the aggregation, or uh, for example, the, the percentage of the aggregation or the percentage of the dimerization of the sample. Then we can do some time course experiments. We can check the stability of our sample over the time, over the temperature ramp, which is the melting temperature calculation. We can also check the aggregation with different buffers. And this technique is most of the time used as the very quick purity control because the experiments in DLS are very quick. One measurement takes, I don't know, two, three minutes. So you can quickly assess the quality of your sample in a tube without using a lot of this sample and know if your sample is already aggregated or not. You can compare the different purifications. This is very useful in big pharma, for example. And you can also check if modifying the buffer will make the sample more or less stable. And these are the sources of the additional information that you, you, you may use if you want to further extend your knowledge on light scattering techniques. And that's all for the first part of the lecture. And I welcome all the questions. Thank you very much, uh, Marius, for your talk. Um, I have. Uh, I would like to ask you to uh, to put the questions uh, into our chat. Okay, uh, it's a little bit easier for us to follow. Where can I see the chat? At least your uh, a question, or at least uh, the information that you uh, would like to ask a question. Okay, so there is a question about how DLS performs with multiple proteins in a single sample. Um, so very nice question. So one may expect that if we have mixture of 
for example, monomers, dimers, and trimers, we would get three separate peaks coming from monomers, dimers, and trimers. This is okay. not true. The resolution of dynamic light scattering is not that high. We can okay. discriminate between, between the particles that are at least five, five times larger than our original one. Okay. So if our particles are heterogeneous, for example, we have a mixture of monomers and dimers, then what we'll get is a radius that is somewhere in between monomers and dimers. But what we'll observe directly is the increase of the polydispersity, which is the half width of this peak. So if this peak is very narrow, it means that the sample is monodispersed, which means that most of the time we are dealing with a single population of the particles. If we have mixture of monomers and dimers, then the polydispersity will increase to, I don't know, 20%, 25%, and that will indicate that the sample is not very monodispersed. Now, if you are dealing with population of the particles that differ a lot with the molecular weight, then we can observe those populations as a separate peaks. For example, if you are working with the monomer protein of the virus capsid and the assembled capsids, then you will observe both peaks from the capsids and from the monomer because the difference on, in size is very huge here. Okay, thank you. That's what I thought about. Uh, I don't see uh, more questions, so I think uh, we all deserve for a coffee break. Uh, 15 minutes, uh, I would like to keep uh, with this. And so we, uh, we meet uh, together again uh, at, uh, uh, in, in 15 minutes. Uh, 